Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dina Atwell, and my topic for today is an inside look at insider threats. Um, just want to say a quick thank you to Day of Security for having me. It's my first time speaking here, and it's been such an enjoyable experience, and I've loved listening to all of my fellow presenters today. Like I said, my name is Dina. Um, a little bit about myself. I call Washington, D.C. home with my husband, my 10-month-old son, and a bunch of cats. I've been in the insider threat space now for about 10 years. I started off as a private investigator while in graduate school, then worked at Nordstrom as a regional investigator, moved down to D.C., and started my career here. I worked six years on a contract at the State Department Bureau of Diplomatic Security in the Cyber Threat Analysis Division, and we focused really on cyber insider threats, um, worked with many of our embassies to ensure that government secrets were kept secret, and finally landed at the best place where I am now, Capital One. Um, I absolutely cannot say enough amazing things about Capital One, and I've been on the cyber insider threat team for about two years, working as a manager and ensuring that our data, our associates, and our customer information is all kept safe. I'm also super passionate about volunteering, mentoring, and creating an encouraging community. So here's a sneak peek of what I will be discussing for the next 20 minutes or so. I'm going to try to give you a pretty solid foundational understanding of insider threats, talk about why it matters, dive into a case study to bring all the stuff that I talked about together, and then finally provide you with some takeaways that you could think about and hopefully take back to your organization to make it stronger and more resilient against insider threats. I'm more than happy to follow up with any questions or chat after this. Um, I really do love talking about insider threat. So I'll have my contact info at the end of the presentation if you'd like to reach out. Okay, so the million dollar question, what's an insider threat? The definition on this screen gives a pretty good overview, but I wanted to point a few things out. So one is someone with trusted access to something, usually an employee with an organization like a company or government agency. Two, insider threats could be witting or unwitting, so malicious or not malicious. Um, maybe they're just not aware of security practices. Today, though, we're going to be focusing on the malicious, deliberate insider, the person who wants to cause some sort of harm. And then three, what kind of harm are they causing? I'll go into it a bit more shortly, uh, but the insider threat is doing something illegal or against the organization's rules that causes some sort of harm to the organization. And typically, when you hear the phrase insider threat, you may think of pretty recent threats like Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, or even going way back in the day, um, spies like Benedict Arnold. Okay, so maybe this is the million dollar question. What's the cost of an insider? Well, more than a million dollar question, insider threats cost organizations a ton of money. Aside from the reputational impact, possible lives lost from sensitive information leaking, depending on what organization we're talking about, which I'll dive into later, um, possible intrusion on the privacy of customers, insider threats cost organizations a ton of money and cause substantial damage. Aside from recanting case studies and pointing out all the damage done, it's easy to point to real numbers, especially when gaining support from leadership to stand up and operate a robust insider threat team. These numbers could vary by industry, but they all have a really high dollar amount. Okay, so now we know what we consider an insider threat, how much they cost an organization. Um, let's dive a bit deeper. So there's four main types of insider threats. Insider threat programs should be aware of these types of threats and working or working on a plan to combat them. The first type of insider threat is intellectual property theft or data exfiltration. IP theft is when someone robs a company of its creative expressions, designs, inventions, or trade secrets, which all collectively is known as intellectual property IP. So in short, um, IP is the intangible property that belongs to an organization. I also usually call this data exfil, even though data exfil does occur in other situations and in espionage as well. When I talk about IP theft or data exfil, it means to me that the insider is removing information like from the computer. So usually through email to a personal email address or a USB stick to use for something else. We usually see in IP theft cases commonly that the insider is leaving the company, plans to leave the company, 
and wants to take that information with them, maybe to start their own company or for a competitive advantage. And IP theft and data exfil could really range in terms of impact. Uh, one example was for Tesla. Uh, they actually sued a manufacturer of electrical SUVs over stealing their trade secrets. And according to Tesla, there was about 70 employees that left the company and joined a rival company and took the trade secrets with them. The next type of insider threat is IT sabotage. So here the insider is using some sort of technical method to cause harm or disruption to the organization. The insider could delete important information or files from the network, reset servers, or even reset passwords to lock other employees out. IT sabotage motivations usually are because of disgruntlement and research has found that there are more behavioral, behavioral indicators for IT sabotage because of that emotional motivation more than, like I said, IP theft would have. The next major type of insider threat is espionage. Everyone's usually familiar with spies, and in the insider threat community, this would be a spy that's already in the organization, either deciding on their own accord to spy or is recruited to spy by a nation state or government. The case study I'll talk about shortly is one of espionage, so we'll really dive into it um, in a few minutes. But the one point I did wanna make here is espionage motivators, they're commonly referred to as mice. So M, money, the person's in debt or thinks it's an easy way to make money. Um, ideology, for I, the person truly agrees with the adversary. They even may volunteer themselves to a foreign government to spy. Uh, C is coercion, which basically is blackmail by the adversary to do what they want. And last is E, ego. Some insiders may feel like they're discounted and they really want to show how smart or valuable they truly are. Finally, workplace violence is a threat that could be verbal, physical, or written, and it's intended to cause harm to other employees. Insider threat programs can work to combat this and keep the workplace safe by looking for certain indicators on the critical pathway, which I'll discuss in the next slide. So now you have an idea of what we consider an insider and the types. So how does someone actually become an insider threat? There's a model that's commonly used in the insider threat community based off of research called Shaw's critical pathway, the critical pathway. Um, the idea of the pathway is that there's a combination of items that all contribute to an insider threat action or workplace violence. So first on the pathway, the first stop, you see personal predispositions. So insider threats usually have some sort of personal predisposition, such as issues um, with their personality or social skills. But this alone, obviously, doesn't make an insider threat, right? Um, so you keep going on the pathway. Next is stressors. Stressors then factor in, such as stress from a divorce or maybe a poor performance review at work or maybe financial stressor, stressors, right? Someone's in a lot of debt. But... Then again, tons of people go through divorce and have stress in their lives, right, and have debt, and they're not insiders. Um, but combined with personal predispositions, the individual is now on the pathway. Then these items start to manifest in concerning behavior. Um, and this is the perfect time for the organization to step in and identify this. Um, and I would say that the goal of an insider threat program, right, is to really identify those individuals and remove them from the pathway so they don't commit that insider threat action. Maybe the organization refers them to counseling or a referral to human resources to get the help that they need. Because at this point, they still didn't commit any insider threat actions. However, if the organization's response is problematic and it's listed there, like they um, aren't paying attention or they don't have an adequate investigation, then this usually does lead to that insider threat activity um, which we'll see. So now that we talked about the critical pathway, I want you to think of that as a lens um, as I discuss this case study. So if you haven't heard of Aldrich Ames, you're about to get a pretty good introduction to him. I love this case study because as a part of him and his wife's plea agreements, they both agreed to cooperate fully with the government to explain the nature and the extent of their espionage activities. So we have an awesome in-depth congressional report on the whole story um, and like quotes from him and everything. So it's really good. I'm going to try and shorten the story as much as possible, but still leave in the most important details. And there's a ton that went into this case and it's super interesting. Um, and you could just Google for the, for the IG congressional report and read it all online too. So when Ames was a kid, 
in the 50s, we're going way back, um, his dad started working for the CIA, Directorate of Operations, and they moved to Virginia. So his dad had one overseas tour that his family went on him with, um, and it wasn't so great. He received a really negative performance review, his dad, right? And it came to light that, again, his dad had a really serious drinking problem. Um, so he was put on probation by the CIA, but he did stay with them and eventually retired from the CIA once he was a bit older. So fast forward a bit, and Ames decides to follow in his dad's footsteps and also um, work for the CIA. So he did some analyst work, but then he was applied and accepted for a career trainee program in 1967. So during this training, the CIA taught Ames the skills necessary for CIA officers to recruit and manage agents. So basically those individuals who provide the CIA with information or other forms of assistance. Such officers within the CIA are known as operations or case officers. Um, and that's what he was, Ames. So he met his first wife, they got married, and both of them went on their first tour to Turkey together. And it started off good. Um, so during his first year, he was rated as a strong performer and was promoted. But then his performance during the second and third years gradually declined. His bosses didn't think he was a good operations officer and basically said to him that he should return to Virginia and just continue his career in Langley which was basically the worst thing you can say to someone that does that job. Um, and he was devastated by this. And he later told his friends that he considered quitting the CIA at this point, but he didn't. Um, during this time, evidence of his drinking problem also surfaced. So uh, his colleagues recant that he was drunk on many occasions during different work parties where, uh, you know, they had to help him home. Um, and it's also implied in the congressional report that he was uh, trying to cheat on his wife with a coworker at a holiday party as well. So he then went on a solo tour in Mexico. He actually did cheat on his wife a bunch. Um, and then he decided he wanted to divorce her. So here in Mexico, he met his second wife, Maria Rosario, who was the cultural attache at the Colombian embassy in Mexico City. So Rosario's interesting because they were introduced through a CIA colleague of Ames's who recruited Rosario in 1982 as a paid source. So by virtue of her membership on the board of the local diplomatic association, she knew many diplomats from many of the embassies in Mexico um, and also knew a KGB officer who served on the same board. So despite agency re uh, regulations, Ames didn't report his romance with a foreign national to his superiors. And some of his colleagues you know, knew about this relationship. He wasn't necessarily trying to keep it a secret, um, but that still didn't prompt him to file the necessary reports. So that's a little odd. Um, at the same time, his bosses soon started to notice that he was making some pretty serious mistakes. His inattention to detail led to two really big security violations, and one was leaving top secret information out for others to see, which is a huge, um, huge violation. So 1983, he separated from his first wife, but he had to pay her monthly payments. And he also had to pay the debt that they had together, which was around $30,000. The IG report indicated that Ames believed his divorce settlement threatened to bankrupt him. At the same time, um, you know, he has a new partner, a new wife, and he was providing for her as well. So they faced a new car loan and mounting credit card payments. So Ames later admitted that these particular financial difficulties led him to first contemplate espionage in 1984. So it was September 1983, returned to his headquarters, and here, um, this is an important kind of note. He was made counterintelligence branch chief for Soviet operations. So his assignment gave him the access he needed to be um, to be valuable, right? So it was all CIA plans, operations targeted against the KGB and the GRU intelligence services. So with this information, he realized like, hey, I have super valuable information. And he conceived a plan to obtain money from the Soviets without being detected by the CIA or the FBI. So this is a really interesting story next. He entered the Soviet embassy in Washington, DC um, on April 16th, 1985. And he handed an envelope to the front desk and offered his services. So he was just a walk-in. Um, he requested payment of $50,000 for his services. He went back to the embassy a month later. He was taken to a private room and they offered to pay him that $50,000 and to keep working with him. And he accepted that. And he later said he decided at that point he wasn't going to stop and he was going to keep going with this. So fast forward a little bit. 
According to his colleagues, he started to really now show some more concerning indicators. He became so intoxicated during a meeting with foreign officials. He made inappropriate remarks about the CIA, their personnel, and he passed out at the table. Um, in 1992, he took a huge risk and he actually took his personal computer with him, which contained unauthorized classified information and personal files on a trip. He also was still spending a ton of money. Um, evidence developed by the FBI indicated that between April of 85 and November of 93, so not, not too long of a time, he spent over a million dollars, um, which should have been, you know, there should have been a red flag going up somewhere, right? Um, he spent large sums of money on home improvements, furniture, cars, bills, credit card payments, and more. Um, he actually traded in his three-year-old Jaguar for a brand new model because three years old was just too old for him. Um, the fact that he purchased not one, but two Jaguars within a three-year period actually went unnoticed by investigators until they were well into completing their financial analysis on Ames. He actually said that he considered this purchase of the second Jaguar within three years to be the only time that he flaunted his money and considered that his greatest financial indiscretion. Um, in November of 89, he returned home from another tour and the CIA first received that information, which pointed directly to Ames. And it was actually just another CIA employee reporting it. Um, he knew Ames pretty well, and he reported to the counterintelligence center that Ames seemed to be living beyond his means, uh, which we could see was true. Um, but he pointed that he pointed to the fact that Ames purchased a particularly expensive home in Arlington, Virginia. And on the slide, there's some facts about Ames. Um, and how the CIA and FBI found out, like, were tipped off to something was happening, was the Russian officials that were being recruited by the CIA were actually being arrested and executed, right? So these are these are Russian officials that are trying to help our uh, the United States government. Um, and they realized, hey, these are all human sources that provided critical intelligence information about the USSR. So they realized it was probably someone on the inside. Um, and below is a direct quote from Ames. And he says, classified information for what he gave up, right? Classified information, human sources, uh, virtually all Soviet agents of the CIA and other American and foreign services known to me, and a huge quantity of information on United States foreign, defense, and security policies. So quickly, going back to the critical pathway slide, I bolded everything that Ames case study matches and wrote in what matched. So I kind of looked at the case study, looked at that, um, looked at the critical pathway. And as you can see, it was not hard to do. The critical pathway definitely does apply here, right? He had um, some personal predispositions, like rule violations. He didn't report um, his relationship with the foreign national. He had a ton of stressors, uh, obviously financial stressors, his divorce. He had a lot of concerning behaviors as I listed them out, right? Leaving out documents, um, being super intoxicated during work. And then there was the problematic organizational response, right? People kind of knew something was off, but it wasn't really brought to the attention of superiors. Um, there was no risk assessment. And then there was that inadequate investigation where they didn't realize his spending habits, even though they were so obvious until they were well into their um, investigation. So now let's take action, right? Like we were scared a little bit, but we scared because we care. So what can your organization do to combat insider threats? Well, it may seem pretty obvious, but actually establishing an insider threat program with the recommended guidelines listed on the screen is first. So only 21% of cyber of company cybersecurity budgets actually have a dedicated component to mitigate insider threats. And I believe it's above 90% of senior cybersecurity leaders still believe that their company's board requires better understandings of insider risks and insider threats. So it's important to have a working program. There's a ton of great information and guidance from the National Insider Threat Task Force, the NITTF website, um, that could walk your team through this step by step. It's really good documentation. And then also to the right on the slide, you see a graphic for an insider threat hub. So an insider threat hub are teams of personnel from multiple disciplines within the same organization. So these teams are designed to put in place processes to examine concerning behaviors 
from a more coherent position with the intent of deterring, detecting, and mitigating risks associated with insiders. This proactive strategy um, often identifies and resolves issues, like I said, before a potential insider becomes a threat to themselves or the organization, so taking them off that critical pathway. Basically, the hub is like a fusion center, um, and each part of the hub has a piece of the puzzle, but they're all working together so they could put that puzzle, you know, together and get a full picture of what's really going on. Um, it's a bit hard sometimes, you know, when you have someone from legal looking at something and maybe someone from human resources that sees something um, that's anomalous and someone from cyber, uh, but all together, that's when you really get the full picture and you could take action. So wrapping up, as I mentioned earlier, I've worked in cyber and insider threat for some time. And cyber is where I would sit uh, looking back at that hub graphic that I showed. So to me, cyber is key in an insider threat program. While insider threat's obviously a human problem, cyber is so important because that's where everything's stored now, right? And to be honest, most organizations, like I mentioned before, are not fully equipped to keep up with changing and sophisticated technologies. Uh, to me, the most important aspects of a cyber insider threat program are listed on the side. Um, there are two things, the people and the tooling. It's important to build a team that has a blend of skill sets. Uh, to me, the most important skill set is someone that's curious and has great analytical and investigative skills. Many of the best people on my teams have always had the curiosity and the drive to really keep digging when they feel like something isn't right or is amiss. Also, tooling is a huge part of what allows the cyber portion of an insider threat team to be effective. So we often say that looking for an insider threat could be like finding a needle in a haystack. There's just so much data, right? If you think of all the millions and billions of logs and records that your computer produces, um, it's impossible to go through that and to find something. It's like a needle in a haystack. So these tools help parse the data and identify what's truly anomalous, right? Because that's what we're looking for. So the types of tools I would say are a must are a user activity monitoring tool, um, a security incident and event management tool, and a user behavioral analytics tool. So first, uh, the UAM or SIM tool, it's a tool that monitors and tracks end user behavior on devices, networks, and other company-owned IT resources. So the purpose is to protect information while ensuring availability and compliance with data privacy and security regulations. So UAM simply goes beyond um, you know, just typical monitoring network activity. So it monitors all types of user activity, including all system, data, application, and network actions that users take, such as web browsing activity and whether users are accessing unauthorized or sensitive files. So in order to make the data collected by this solution as useful as possible, you have to really analyze the data. Um, for, you know, if there's a bunch of data, you have to analyze it, put it in context, like what time of day is it? Is it normal for the user to access this? Um, is there any associated risk with it? And really just the context of the data. And this is where the UBA tool comes in. User behavioral analytics is a threat detection technology that uses analytics to identify anomalous activity or malicious user behavior. So in order to detect these behaviors, it uses data science combined with machine learning and algorithms to understand the user's typical behaviors as they traverse the enterprise environment. So it creates a baseline and it says, you know, what your normal behavior is or your trends, your normal trends. And then it runs a series of algorithms in order to pinpoint anomalous activity that deviates from that baseline. And I listed some cyber uh, indicators to the right of the slide that you can probably focus on, take a look at. And the tools identify this, but then this is where the human, right, where the investigators or the analysts have to step in and figure out the context of what's going on and per perform analysis and an investigation and even lean on other hub members to gather more information for that complete picture. So wrapping up, thank you so much for attending um, an inside look at insider threats. I hope you learned a little bit about insider threats and feel like you have a, a foundational understanding or at least took away some cool uh, trivia from the case study. So like I mentioned when I introduced myself, I love to chat about insider threats. So happy to meet new people. So please feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you again. And I actually see a question um, in the chat from Gita. 
So any suggestions on tools for UAM or EBA? Um, so honestly, if you Google it, you'll find probably the most popular tools of Raytheon Technologies. Forcepoint has a UAM tool that's used across the government generally. Um, some people build their own in-house UBA tools uh, with data scientists. Um, and I would say Forcepoint um, is probably a big one. Uh, Proofpoint, Observe, Observe It, Observe IT is another huge one as well. Um, and it's just really finding out what works best for your organization and also making sure that you have the data um, that you can feed into that tool. I think that's probably the most important part, right? Because they all kind of um, are looking at the same things, but making sure that you can really use that tool to help you the best. And if there's any follow-up questions, I know that was a lot of information too. Um, like I said, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or feel free to email me and I can definitely uh, talk some more with you about it. But thank you so much for listening.